Hi everyone, my name is Monique. And I'm Naveen from Before You Play. And today we're going to be showing you how to play a game that is currently on Kickstarter called Call of Duty The Board Game. Yes, this game is designed by Brian and Benjamin Pope and it's published by Arcane Wonders who are helping sponsor this video. In this game, we are in the Call of Duty universe. Call of Duty is a very famous uh, video game that mm -hmm. came out many, many years ago and it's had so many iterations over the course of the years. I'm a big fan of the IP, so we are showcasing Call of Duty, the board game today. Yes, usually I'm the one who connects with the IPs of the board games that we cover, but this time it's uh, Naveen's turn. I've been playing it on Xbox for <laughs> 15 plus years, um, and I've played pretty much every single iteration of Call of Duty. And so today we're going to be showing you how to play it by basically going through a round of the game. Uh, there are two different main modes of play. There's a basic and advanced, and then there are also various modules that you can kind of mix and match. But before we begin, we do need to mention that our copy of the game is a very early prototype copy, which means things are subject to change in the future, and there are probably going to be a lot of things coming in the actual retail version of the game that we don't have. Mm -hmm. So if you'd like to learn more information about it, we've included a link to the Kickstarter down below. Now, if you'd like to see a full two-player playthrough of this game, there's at least one that we're aware of, which is our good friend Tim Schwan, who makes really nice cinematic experiences, and we'll link his video in the description below. Now, lastly, if you like these kind of videos and you want to see more in the future, please consider subscribing. And with that, we are ready to begin. So if you'd please direct your attention to the center of the table, we're all set up here for our two-player game of Call of Duty the board game. Yes. Welcome to the battle zone. Right. Well, almost all set up. Uh, we technically both should have our own player screens, which mm -hmm. is going to be hiding from our opponents, this little map over here. Right. Uh, but we're not going to showcase that right now. Because in this game, if you're not familiar with the IP or the video game at all, this is technically a first person shooter. First person shooter, for sure. That's what the video game is. In mm -hmm. this board game, we're going to be going around uh, trying to eliminate our enemies in order to score points, as well as trying to maintain control of the flag as long as possible. And in the basic game, it's whoever uh, can score five points first is the winner. Mm -hmm. Now, the prototype that we were sent is for a two-player game only. So we're not exactly sure what it's going to look like in the final uh, Kickstarter campaign. Mm -hmm. But the prototype that we have is for a one versus one game. Yep. I believe in the future there will be um, some sort of possibility for you to be able to play a team game. But for now, this is the intent. And so like we're mentioning, there are two main modes of play that we are aware of. There's the basic game, which we are actually set up for right now with uh, the basic sort of side of our operator mats as well as our weapons. Mm -hmm. And then there's the advanced game that incorporates a lot of uh, modules that you can kind of pick and choose from. And so today I'm going to be operating a Simon Ghost Riley, who I believe is a character in the video game. That's true, Monique, <laughs> yes. And I am General Shepard. If you know General Shepard, you know. Yeah. Um, and so I'm going to be this character so cryptic. right here. Yes. Is that AKA Shep? Shepard? Shep, uh, Shep, no, 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 just General Shepard. Now, in addition to our operators, each player also has their own weapon. And this determines the dice that you're going to be choosing from and rolling uh, whenever you go into combat. Right. Your weapon also shows your two different uh, aim meters, depending on if it's a long range attack or a short range attack. And this is all going to come into effect during combat but these are asymmetric, as mm -hmm. you can see. Yep. And also, each player has a hand of combat cards, and so the ones that we are using are for the basic game, of course, as well as their own uh, personal planning mat, right. which completely mirrors the main board, as you can see. This is going to be used to plan out our routes uh, during the planning phase, and it's typically hidden behind your player screen. So usually you would most likely be sitting across from each other mm -hmm. so that you cannot see your opponent's uh, planning mat. And so the way that the game works is each round is divided into two main phases. You start with the planning phase, where players are going to simultaneously, behind their screen, choose where their person is going to walk to uh, throughout the round. So mm -hmm. we have four of these planning tokens. And you're basically going to lay them out on these uh, different nodes that represent these spaces that are on the main board. And then once everybody has laid out all of their movements, then you simultaneously resolve each action marker one by one and checking to see if any combat happens after each action marker. Mm -hmm. So since this is the basic game that we're demonstrating right now, let's just go ahead and start by uh, doing a planning phase together, shall sure. we? Why not? And actually, before we start planning out our movements, just a couple of basic things about the board. In addition to the circular spaces where our miniatures are going to be moving to, each space is actually connected by a colored line. Mm -hmm. And this is important because it determines what's called line of sight. If after an action, two characters are uh, next to each other, or not necessarily next to each other, but they're connected via the same colored line, mm -hmm. then they're considered to be within line of sight. And after that action, then a combat happens. So right. that is something that we have to consider. There are also a few things on the board, such as these uh, shield symbols that represent cover. 
-hmm. And so those offer a little bit of protection whenever you are standing on a spot that's connected to one. Right. And of course, one of the major features of the board is the flag, which is in the very center. One of our goals is to try to get there and hold it for as long as possible, because at the end of each round that we maintain control of this space, we're going to score a point. Mm -hmm. And in the basic game, you only need to score five points to win, right? right. So right. let's go ahead and assign our action tokens. Mm -hmm. All right, Naveen, are you ready? I'm ready, yes. Okay, so we placed out all of our action tokens. We are ready to execute in the second half of the game. But before we do, we just want to remind you that if you're playing the advanced version of this game, you definitely do not want to remove your player screens because there are certain items that you are go going to want to deploy privately. And so player screens are very important. But because this is the basic game, we're going to just remove them we're so just that we can demonstrate demonstrate. to show it off. Exactly. All right. Standard opening move. <laughs> it looks like we are both trying to rush to the center over here. Yep. And so now that we've put out all of our action tokens, these basically represent a single movement of our player piece. You can stay in the same spot, but you would just leave an action token where you're standing. Mm -hmm. But it looks like we both are going to move. Rushing. So then what would happen is we would both simultaneously resolve each action token one at a time, starting with the first one. Okay. So it looks like I'm going to be moving to this spot over here. And then I also have the action token facing this way. So that's important because it determines where I'll be facing. If you are facing in the direction of combat once it triggers, it'll give you a bonus. Mm -hmm. So you really want to be uh, careful about that. Yeah, you want to be facing where your gun's pointing. Exactly. Yeah. So I'm going to go ahead and take my first movement. So my first is I'm going to be moving General Shepard this way, facing that way, because mm -hmm. that's where this gun is showing this way. All right. So then after you resolve an action token, you always check the board to see if anybody is within line of sight. We are not. We are pretty far away. So we're going to keep on going. Mm -hmm. All right. So then action token number two, I am moving this way okay. and facing down that blue line. Okay. So I am moving this way and then facing up this kind of green and red line. Yes. And so that's important to note that he is actually facing down both colors of lines. Right. And this is important because had I moved here instead, then that would have initiated a combat since the green line connects both of these nodes together. Yeah. But we continue. So my third action token moves me this way and facing down this line because I want to get to the flag. Gotcha. Really. And same. Uh, so I'm coming in this way and then I face you. All right. And so now we so do have we something, are. some drama. We have combat because we are connected by an unbroken same colored line. It uh, doesn't matter, even if I had been facing in a different direction, that would still trigger combat right. because of the fact that we are connected by that line. But the fact that we're looking at each other is going to give us both what's called an on-target bonus. So let's go ahead and resolve combat. Sure. Now during combat, each player is going to choose one combat card to play. So at the start of the game, you're actually supposed to shuffle your entire deck and draw a starting hand of three. three. Yep. Now when resolving combat, we are pretty much going to do a big calculation of all of the various aspects that are coming into play, including how tactical we are being mm -hmm. on the uh, the battlefield as well as what combat card we're playing and what type of weapon we have. Sure. And afterwards, we are going to have a final firepower value that's going to determine who the winner is of this specific combat. The loser will get eliminated, meaning you'll have to remove your piece from the board and respawn on the next round. Yep. And the winner will score a point and also be allowed to determine whether they would like to continue taking the rest of their actions that are on their planning board. But first, you have to determine the aim meter that you're going to use. Mm -hmm. And to do that, you look at how far away your two pieces are. And so for a distance of two or more away, that is considered a long distance range. Long range. And for that, you would use the top meter. So you're going to go ahead and put your cube on the starting space of the top meter, which is uh, indicated by that symbol. If you were zero to one nodes away, then of course you would just use the bottom meter. In addition, one of your other cubes also starts on the zero space of your tactical tracker. This tracker is very important because we are going to be adding and subtracting uh, from this range, mm -hmm. depending on what kind of bonuses and penalties we have. First, we check if we have a wound token. Mm -hmm. Because this is the start of the game, neither of us do. Nope. But if you did, then this would subtract by one space which of course would decrease from your firepower. Then you check to see if your operator is on target. And we already discussed this earlier. Both of us are because we are at least one node away and we are facing the proper direction of combat. Mm -hmm. So because of that, we get a two bump bonus in the opposite direction. Right. One, two. There you go. Next, if your operator is on a node that's connected to one of these shield symbols and this is the path that is involved in combat, you would take one of these cover tokens and place it on this spot of your tactical board. This is going to give you an additional uh, defensive benefit when we start resolving the dice, mm -hmm. but because that does not apply to any of us, 
we don't get it. Nobody gets it. Mm -hmm. There are also additional spots on the board, such as these nodes that are connected to pluses as well as minuses. They thematically uh, represent areas of greater advantage or a disadvantage in yeah. the case of this uh, ladder yeah, right here. Technically, this is high ground, right? So if you're shooting from top down, you have a greater vantage point than mm -hmm. somebody below you. And then you'd be at a strategic disadvantage if you were mm -hmm. on this ladder because it's kind of hard to shoot up a ladder. And you would also move your tactical tracker depending on those bonuses, but neither of us are on a space that would apply. Mm -hmm. So now we would each simultaneously select a combat card from our hand and place it face down because we're going to reveal it at the same time. Combat cards look like this. They all offer uh, certain types of bonuses at the bottom left hand corner that we're going to take into consideration when calculating everything. Mm -hmm. In addition, each card shows different uh, values of firepower depending on the different thresholds of your aim meter. Mm -hmm. When calculating our final firepower, depending on where this cube is on your aim meter is going to determine what uh, value or how strong your firepower was, if yep. that makes sense. Yep. So let's just go ahead and choose one of these. Sure. All right, I'm gonna go ahead and choose this card. I'll take this one, put it there. Perfect. And then before we reveal our cards, we're actually going to choose dice from our die pool to roll. Mm -hmm. Now, each player's weapon determines uh, what combination of each color dice actually start in your pool, as well as how many dice you choose during combat, which in this case, it's going to be seven each. Mm -hmm. Red dice are aggressive. They just show different values of firepower, but they're also a little bit risky because there's a way that uh, you can essentially nullify those dice. Yep. Blue dice represent your aim. Depending on what the net value of all of your, uh, your aim is, it's going to determine how far your cube uh, moves up on the aim meter. And the green dice are the agility dice that help uh, decrease your opponent's aim and also determine how fast you are because they show a different uh, number of lightning bolt symbols mm -hmm. and that basically determines who gets to move first. So I'm gonna go ahead and choose three green dice, two blue, and two red. All right, well, I'm doing three green, three blue, and one red. And now again, this selection is all happening behind your screen, so yes. your opponent does not know what dice are being selected. That's right. Let's go ahead and reveal our cards. Sure. Okay. Ready? One, two, yep. three. I'm, I'm playing the fast maneuvers card. Okay, I'm playing controlled shot. And then we roll our dice. All right. So let's go ahead and just group these up Ooh, by color. This is not good. <laughs> we are now going to resolve everything based off of their symbols. Okay. The first thing that happens is you determine who has first strike. And you do this by counting up all of the lightning bolt symbols that you have on your dice as well as your combat card. Sure. So I have three showing on this green die and one. So I have a total of four. Okay. So I do not have one on my combat card, mm -hmm. but I have two, three, four as well. So we both ah. are tied. Because it's a tie, neither of us gain this bonus. Perfect. But had somebody uh, earned the bonus of having first strike, then they would be able to move up one space on their tactical tracker. And that's represented by this area over here. Mm -hmm. Then we're both going to add up our aim values, which are uh, this specific symbol on the blue dice. It looks like I have a total of eight. Okay, so I have a total of eight here, but my combat card also gives me an additional three. So I have 11 total. Good thing I have these shields because with that number, you're going to deduct all of the shields that are showing on your opponent opponent's dice and combat card. So I have a total of four shields. Yeah, so my total aim again was 11 minus that four. So I moved this up one, two, three, four, five, six, seven. And again, if somebody had a cover token, that would be an additional two shields that you would deduct from that value. Mm -hmm. Now for me, I have four total shields. Okay, and I had uh, eight. eight. So eight minus four is four. four. That's not as much as yours, two, three, four. But you're All in right. that yellow zone. That's true. And speaking of these zones, we now determine our final firepower by looking at the combat card we chose and consulting our aim track to determine the value of our shot, I guess. Mm -hmm. So because my uh, my aim meter here ended up in the yellow threshold, my, I would have a value of six, right. which doesn't sound very high. No, right uh, well, uh, I'm in the orange over here and my controlled shot also gets me six. Oh, well. okay. Yeah. So we're pretty much even here. Mm -hmm. Now with that number, you would add it to the value on your tactical tracker, which for me is four. Right, I'm also four. So, so we're at a 10. Right. And here's where we break the tie. So if your cube on your aim tracker actually ends up on this black space here, that is considered a critical miss. And then that would just be your final score right there. That'd, that'd be bad. But because it, neither of us had a critical miss, we get to add up the values of our red dice. That's why these red dice are a bit risky because if you ever have a critical miss, then these are not taken into consideration at all. It's also risky if you roll a blank. That's true. Like how I did. <laughs> I rolled a total of five which means I get to add that to my 10. Right. And so my final firepower uh, is 15. And I rolled a zero, so mine is 10. Yes. 
which means I win this combat and Naveen is eliminated. Too bad. Now, had this ended in a tie, then the tiebreaker would go to whichever player had first strike. Mm -hmm. And if there's still a tie, then both players are eliminated. So somebody is definitely getting eliminated every time you go into combat. It can't happen in the video game. And this actually signals the end of combat. Mm -hmm. So we can go ahead and take our dice back. Yep. The player who gets eliminated actually removes their piece from the board. Oh, You're going shit. to be able to Off choose to go. respawn. <laughs> I keep thinking this is you. I know. This is you. That's me. Now, if I had any wounds, which we haven't talked about yet, I would be able to discard it because I am eliminated. I come back with full health. Uh, and because I was eliminated, I also get to draw back up to three total cards. Mm -hmm. Now, I didn't go down without a fight. Monique will be taking a wound for this ghost. Take that. That's right, because yeah. if your final fire powers are within five of each other, mm -hmm. then whoever won takes a wound. And this is bad because in the future, this is going to uh, take away from my fire power strength. Mm -hmm. Now, each round that I have this, this is actually going to flip over and uh, lessen in severity. And then the round after that, this will get removed, which is good and bad. It is a way to heal, but that it also means I will be holding on to it for a while. If I ever get eliminated, though, I get to discard that. Mm -hmm. The good thing, though, is I get a point. You do? So for eliminating this is actually, me. we actually start at zero, right. but that is one point. And I have a choice to make. I now have to decide if I want to continue out with my actions or if I just want to end the round here. Now, it's all or nothing. You have to either choose to take the rest of the actions that you had planned or you just completely stop the round. I am, of course, going to choose to continue out my actions because it will get me to the middle flag the here. The coveted flag. Which is another way for me to score a point. Anytime you move your operator on or through the node that has a flag symbol, then you take control of the flag. If in a future round, Naveen were to run through this, then he would flip this over to show his side. And basically at the end of the round, whoever's controlling this gets a point. Mm -hmm. Now, if you are ever eliminated, then your token would get removed because sure. you no longer control the flag. But I'm just gonna go ahead and, uh, and leave that there. <laughs> but I'm gonna be staring down this direction, which is important because that is where I placed uh, my planning token. Mm -hmm. Now that all of my actions are done, this ends the round. So before we start the next round, I'm gonna go ahead and flip this over to uh, lessen the severity of Less my wound. wound. And Naveen would secretly choose a new respawn point using what's called dynamic spawning. Mm -hmm. He basically has to do this in secret and has to choose a spot that is anywhere on the board that is not within line of sight of either an operator or the flag objective. So secretly behind my screen, Monique would not be able to know exactly where I'm going to respawn. I would take my little figure and place it somewhere legal. So I'd probably put something like this, which mm -hmm. would equate to this spot on the main board. Right. And of course, we have to reset this to make sure that it looks accurate. Nice and clean. And there are actually a couple of mechanics that go along with the basic training that we didn't discuss, including these sprint tokens. So each player has the ability to sprint uh, once per round in mm -hmm. the basic game. It essentially allows your operator to move up to two spaces using one action. And you would just put the sprint token on the actual board to, to indicate this. Mm -hmm. Now, sprinting is great because it helps you move around the board quickly. But if you're ever caught in combat with the sprint token, then it's going to be a minus one uh, disadvantage on your tactical tracker. The other thing that we didn't mention is there are arrows on the main board that actually indicate a one direction movement only. Mm -hmm. So that is something that you have to keep in mind. Yeah, just like in the game, you can jump off of buildings, mm -hmm. but you can't jump onto buildings. Right, you climb up the ladder, which right. is going to give you a disadvantage. That's it. And then you would continue on to the next round, essentially playing like this until somebody has won the game. Mm -hmm. Now, like we are mentioning earlier, this is the basic version of the game. It's called basic training. You typically wouldn't play with just this version of it. You would add other sort of modules and advanced features. And so we're just going to go ahead and go over a few of those now so that you have an idea as to what to expect. Now, when playing with the advanced game, you actually use a different set of combat cards. Each player now has a deck of 15 each mm -hmm. instead of the six basic ones. And these combat cards have additional effects that are listed at the very bottom of the card. For example, with this careful aim card, it says you also ignore enemy uh, shield cover mm -hmm. when calculating your, your firepower. Some of them also show a tactic icon, which is indicated by that symbol. And in order to use these, you have to place the, the symbol on one of your action tokens. So it's actually used in association with an action that you're taking instead of during combat. Mm -hmm. We also have items. And so during each game, you're going to choose one item to use. And this is one of the reasons why it's important for you to use the player screen. Yes. Because there are grenades that you can secretly deploy 
uh, within two nodes and uh, you won't know where they are until you trigger them essentially. So this specific uh, frag grenade, <laughs> it's called, <laughs> the frag grenade, it says yes. you can deploy it within two <laughs> nodes and you eliminate enemies on that node and deal two wounds to enemies on adjacent nodes. Right. So that is why your um, positioning is going to be very important for deploying some of these items. You also play with the opposite side of your operator board because it shows the, it's called a kill streak right. uh, meter as well as a special asymmetric ability. And so with Simon Ghost Riley here, I have Shadow Strike, which says my attack gains a plus one modifier if an opponent is not facing me. Yeah, you run secret, you're the ghost, right? right? So General Shepard, if you know the game, General Shepard has a Magnum 44. So you start the game with the Magnum 44 item already equipped. In addition to that, Shepard is very resourceful. So you start with a second item as well. You can also choose to use the opposite side of your weapon board yep. that basically has uh, different meters here. And it also shows different uh, features or mechanics that you can incorporate into your game, including a reload mechanic so that you don't have to wait to get eliminated before redrawing your hand. Yeah, you don't want to get eliminated to get cards back. You want to be able to reload mm -hmm. without going out. As well as additional sprint tokens and a mechanic called ADS, which stands for Aim Down Sight. So each player has one of these ADS tokens, and during planning, you kind of determine where you put these. In order to enter into ADS, you have to basically uh, move to a location that has this token and then forfeit the rest of your actions for as long as you want to remain in ADS. Mm -hmm. And the significance of this is if during combat you are both on target and in ADS, then you actually get to start your, uh, your cube on one of the ADS symbols, depending on your range. So if it were a long range battle, then I would place my uh, cube here instead of on that start spot. We also briefly alluded to the kill streak, which is on the advanced side of your operator board. And these basically introduce kill streak cards. And these cards essentially have an effect that come into play as soon as you reach whatever value is on the card on your kill streak board. Think of it like a currency. So whenever you want to call in an airstrike or use the RCXD, mm -hmm. then you spend three and then be able to perform the action on the card. Right. And lastly, each player has their own recruit that that you can incorporate. This is basically a member of your team or an additional enemy for the opposite team. Sure. You're going to be rolling dice for them from your own dice pool. And they can also score you points if you're able to use them to eliminate your opponent's operator. And that's essentially it. Those are the main features and mechanics that come with our version of the early prototype. Now, again, we don't know what is going to be included with the Kickstarter campaign. So if you'd like to check that out, as well as any details maybe regarding a four-player version of the game, we encourage you to check out the Kickstarter that is linked below. Now, if you have any questions about anything you saw here, feel free to leave them in the comments down below, and we'll try to get back to you as soon as we can. Thank you all so much for watching the video. We hope you enjoyed it. If you'd like to see more like this in the future, please consider subscribing. Thank you. Thanks. Bye.